Welcome to Conversations, Season 2 of the MTA Podcast Series, a weekly audio cast featuring interviews with leading investment strategists, geopolitical experts, and other key thought leaders. Brought to you by the Market Technicians Association and your host, Ed Carlson. Our overriding theme is that the economy is going to get better, albeit slowly, and that we will also see continued improvement overseas. This should cause some changes in the intermarket relationships we have become accustomed to. Tuesday, December 7th, 2010, this is Conversations, the official MTA podcast series, and today's guest is Fred Meisner. Fred Meisner, CMT, is the founder and president of the Fred Report. His professional career spans 27 years in the investment business. He has a multifaceted background encompassing market analysis and trading strategies slash portfolio management. Fred's working career includes senior market analysis positions at the Robinson Humphrey Company, Merrill Lynch, and four years as president of the Market Technicians Association. While president of the MTA, the organization moved to a new structure encompassing the hiring of professional managers and successfully changed Sarbanes-Oxley to include the CMT designation as an exemption to the Series 86 requirement for financial analysts. This effectively placed the CMT on par with the CFA designation, thus making technical market analysis and traditional fundamental analysis equal in the eyes of FINRA and in the securities laws of the United States of America. Fred holds a B.S. degree in business administration with a minor in economics from Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas, and an M.A. degree from the University of California, Los Angeles in Latin American studies, encompassing an interdisciplinary curriculum of international business, history, and sociology. Fred Meisner, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. That doesn't sound at all like me, but I guess that is me. I don't think of me as 27 years in the business. Yeah, you can you can rack up a lot of accomplishments in 27 years, or you can waste a lot of time. It looks like you did the former. <laughs> okay. Thanks for, for taking the time to trot down to MTA headquarters today. Um, we appreciate that, Fred. Um, hey, I've got to ask this. How in the world does a guy get from Latin American studies to technical analysis? And, and for that matter, how do you get from business administration to, tech, uh, to Latin American studies? Well, it's, it's a long story, but uh, my father retired in Latin America, and between prep school and college, I really didn't know what I wanted to major in, so I went down and lived with him in Costa Rica, Central America, for a couple of years, learned Spanish, and realized I really loved the culture, mm. and decided that I would uh, make that into a career. My original intention was to be a history professor. However, life has a way of getting in the way, and I went to uh, Trinity and then moved out to San Diego, and the first job I could get in 1980 was in the brokerage business. They had promised to make me a stockbroker at this little company. It was a little company called Private Ledger Financial Services, now Lenco Private Ledger. Right. Um, So I ended up um, at UCLA grad school and was sitting in the cafeteria one day and saw this ad saying, do you want to be a stockbroker? And I said, well, I kind of really want to be a history professor, but I've always <laughs> wanted to do that. <laughs> so I applied at this little company, and they were all doing this stuff called technical analysis, and I thought, well, that's interesting. I'll work at that, and it turned into my life's work, and it's been an awful lot of fun. Wow. Uh, that's neat. Let's back up first, though, a moment, just out of curiosity. What was your father doing in Costa Rica? He was retired. He had worked internationally in Latin America and Mexico and a couple of other countries, uh, just generally uh, doing engineering stuff. He worked at Westinghouse and some people like that. I see. All right. And then uh, where did you go to prep school? Wilbraham and Munson Academy in Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Okay. So you're a Northeasterner by birth. Northeasterner by birth, but I am one of those people that cannot stand cold weather. So after I got out of prep school, I basically said, I'm never going to be cold again. And until my time at Merrill Lynch, the furthest north I'd lived was Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah, that, that sounds familiar. I, I, I hear you perfectly. Um, okay. So you're at Lynch. Oh, no, you're a private ledger. Um, how long were you there, and how did you make the transition to a uh, full-time technical analyst? Well, I was at Private Ledger for about a year, and I was working actually setting up independent brokerage offices for the firm, and it became apparent that they wanted me to do that instead of actually learn stock brokerage. Yeah. So I decided to go to grad school, and when I got to grad school, 
I, as I mentioned, saw an ad uh, in the newspaper looking for stockbrokers for a little firm in Los Angeles called Barabian Securities, went to Barabian Securities, and a number of people that are still very successful in the business were working there, and I learned about technical analysis at that time and decided I, too, could be a technical analyst. So um, you decided that. Who, who gave you a shot? Well, Robinson Humphrey in Atlanta did. I was working as a stockbroker at Dean Witter and applying for jobs in technical analysis. And after, you know, basically two years of looking, Robinson Humphrey in Atlanta, which at the time was a branch of Shearson Lehman Brothers, uh, subsidiary rather, not branch, okay. um, they were looking for a technician down there. And Jeff Weiss, uh, an MTA member, recommended me, and they hired me, and that was my first real shot at the business as an analyst. You know, it was a lot different back then, and one of the reasons I got involved in the MTA was by uh, developing regional chapters. I had a lot of contacts around the country, and uh, we didn't have the infrastructure that the board has put together today. We were just starting that whole process, and I was, I'm was i proud and happy to have been involved in the early part of that and have a lot of respect for what the guys have built since I ended up stepping away from the MTA. They, they've done a great job. It's it's fabulous what you guys have done. Yeah, that, that's neat. How did you meet Jeff Weiss? Uh, it's a long story, but I'll tell it. I met Jeff by... Uh, well, I decided I wanted to meet some technical analysts when I was at UCLA Graduate School. So I called Merrill Lynch and I said, hi, my name's Fred Meissner and I want to meet Bob Farrell. And they told me to go buzz off. <laughs> so I basically, yeah, I was like, that's real nice. A lot of people want to meet him. Click. Right. So I called Shearson up, or E.F. Hutton up at the time, and said, I want to meet uh, Newton Zinder. And they said, well, no way, Jose. Click. So I got a little bit smarter. I called Jeff Weiss's office. I got this uh, wonderful girl on the line named Louise Zeller. I will never forget Louise, Jeff's secretary, and said, I've always wanted to meet someone like Jeff. I'm a grad student. I'm going to be in New York, and you sound like you're awfully nice. Can I bring you by some flowers, and can we have some lunch? Oh, so she God. got me in to see Jeff, and Jeff and I have been friends ever since. Now, where was he working at that time? He was also working at E.F. Hutton. Ah. Um, yeah, I told them sort of a little bit of a white lie to get in. I said I was an E.F. Hutton broker in the Torrance branch of E.F. Hutton. And the only really shaky part about our whole interview was I had to explain that to Jeff after he said, you're the smartest guy I've seen in a long time. I'm calling your manager up and telling him just how smart you are. And I'm like, no, Jeff, you're not going to do that. Uh, and so on. But as I say, we've become friends. No harm, no foul. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay, so you're you're a technical analyst at uh, Robinson Humphrey. How did you uh, get from there to Merrill Lynch? I uh, worked at Robinson Humphrey for 10 years. I basically left that firm in 1999-2000. I had the opportunity to go manage some money, and also I really wasn't too pleased with the way the market was looking at the time, so I wanted to be able to profit by selling short rather than by being 100% long. I worked at my own money management firm for a couple of years and found that, frankly, I'm a much better analyst than I am a manager. Uh, went to work with uh, Ian Notley, who is one of the oh. brilliant technical lights in this business. Right. Lately passed away. Jonathan Arter is keeping his stuff going really right. well. We, we interviewed him. You did. He's a fabulous guy, wonderfully smart. I hope to see him on this trip up to the Northeast. Jonathan and I worked together at Notley for four years, and then I heard Dick McCabe was looking for someone. Dick McCabe was a senior technical analyst at Merrill Lynch that had a lot of experience working with a retail sales system, and I love that aspect. That's actually what I'm doing at the Fred Report is working primarily with retail brokers that know me or that want, you know, objective, quick and dirty technical analysis sort of stuff. And um, so I went to work at Merrill Lynch for four or five years, and then the great 2008 uh, hoorah, uh, my job and about 25, 28% of the whole research department was eliminated there. Really You're talking about, about the merger with Bank of America. Bank of America, yeah. Yeah, yeah, what, uh, <laughs> the night of the long knives. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, a sad thing, but honestly, um, I'm living back in my house in Atlanta. I'm having a wonderful time. Uh, things happen for the best, and I think this has definitely happened for the best. And uh, my business is starting to get some real traction. I think ultimately I'm going to be better off and happier. Mm -hmm. Listen, we, I don't want to bring up any bad memories, but uh, I think our listeners would be very interested to hear about your typical day at Merrill Lynch as a technical analyst. Could you uh, give us some background there? 
certainly. I wrote the uh, daily market letter for the firm, so I would get in in the morning and I'd write uh, a couple of paragraphs on what I felt the stock market was going to do, uh, and I'd post that to the computer system and usually then go off and have a cup of coffee. Um, hmm. Around about 9, 30, 10 o'clock, I'd start fielding calls from financial advisors. Um, I was working with some people on reports throughout most of the day as well. A lot of the day was spent on the phone, depending on the market, with with analysts and at the firm reviewing their stocks, and uh, with financial advisors uh, reviewing their portfolios and stocks. And yeah, I'd have a couple, usually at least one internal meeting a day where we would look at research reports. As part of the uh, Elliott Spitzer rules, there was a thing where analysts had to validate reports, and they had a technical analyst in there all the time. Oh, really? And yeah, it it made sense. There were you know. We literally had to make sure that there wasn't a, you know anything wrong with the recommendations, and it was a very good process. And uh, then I would usually, honestly, most of my work uh, outside of, the, of that time was at night doing all the indicators for the next day. So I usually go home. Everyone knows I take a nap at 4.30. I take a nap from 4.30 to 5.36, and then I would usually walk on back to the office and work in, into the evening a little bit and oh. uh, make notes for the market letter. Look at some of the overseas markets that go home, and and then start the whole process again the next day. You'd m- walk back to the office in the evening. You were you were living in Manhattan. Yeah, I was living in New York City, about uh, three blocks from the office in Battery Park City, and the office huh. was in the World Financial Center, so it was an easy walk. Yeah. Huh. Now, uh, before we leave this particular topic, can you give us some insight as to the, the overall structure of the technical analysis department of Merrill Lynch? I mean, there was you, there was Walter Murphy, Mary Ann Bartels, and God knows how many other people. How, how were responsibilities divided amongst all of you, and what was the overarching goal, or, or was there? Was it just every individuals, or was it a team effort? It was a, it was a real team effort. Mary Ann Bartels took over as the chief technical market analyst from Dick McCabe and did a really good job of organizing us as a team. Uh, Mary Ann sort of oversaw everything and oversaw the outside effort of the of the the team. She traveled a lot. Uh, I worked primarily with retail and traveled to support retail as well as some of the smaller institutional accounts. Walter Murphy mostly stayed in the office. Walter still is probably the best writer of us all in terms of just being able to sit down and write anything at any time about anything and making it sound good. <laughs> and we had Steve Suttmeyer, who's still there. Steve worked a lot with Walter on the writing and such. And we had another couple of people that did, you know, indicator entry, basic mathematics and statistics, worked on some of the more statistical reports that we had. Because um, we were publishing an awful lot of reports. I know I, I did an indicator report every week. Uh, a stock chart publication uh, every week, and as well as writing a market letter every day, and uh, you know other people were writing reports as well. Uh, the overarching goal, of course, was to communicate a technical market opinion, uh, acknowledging the fundamental opinion of the firm, but occasionally diverging from it to all of the clients of Merrill Lynch and uh, all the financial advisors of Merrill Lynch. Okay. We're going to continue with Fred Meissner in a moment, but first a reminder that on next week's program and our last podcast of 2010, we'll have Linda Rashke as our guest. Um, Fred, uh, during these podcasts, we always uh, spend a couple moments in what we call our toolbox file, where we talk about the tools that you use for your analysis. Now, I've read that you break the stock market down into three basic market principles, sentiment, internal momentum, and external momentum. Can you kind of give us a primer on what you mean by all that and how you put it together? Certainly, yes. Um, by sentiment, I, I mean, obviously, the contrary indicators that everyone looks at. I use really only two. I use the put-call ratio, which I feel is a pretty good reflection of individual investor sentiment in the marketplace. Is that and total or use, equity only? I use the total. Okay. Uh, I never. I used to break them apart. I found that I never got anything out of breaking them apart, so I just use the total, and then I use just the straight investors' intelligence numbers. But I do one thing that's a little bit different, and that is I only look at investors' intelligence percent bears, and the reason for that is, you know, 
you can be a bull and be complacent, or you can be a bull and buy, but it is a very rare bear that says, I think the market's going to get down 30%. I'm happy with my stock positions, and I'm going to just watch my money disappear. Excellent point. They seem to always do something if they're really bearish, and I'm, so I'm much more interested in watching what people are going to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I find one thing about sentiment indicators that I think a lot of people overlook That is that sentiment indicators for me are largely condition indicators. They give a backdrop to the market. They say things could be dangerous, but they do not give trading signals to me. They simply say if we get a trading signal that is opposite the prevailing sentiment and the prevailing sentiment is at an extreme, that could be a better signal. But it doesn't in and of itself give a signal then. For internal momentum, I use some things to measure advanced declines and advancing declining volume. I built some of my own tools. I love the McClellan Oscillator, but I found the McClellan Oscillator can sometimes give signals that are early. So I built a breadth oscillator that's slower than the McClellan Oscillator that I use. Um, And I sort of put them together, and I follow those on a short intermediate term basis. And then I also, um, and that's pretty much my internal momentum indicators, and my external momentum indicators are mostly based on price. I use moving averages. I use a simple crossing of the 5 and 20. Uh, if you look at that on any sort of time frame, you'll find it catches all the major trends and usually doesn't keep you in them too long. Uh, I use basic stochastics. Stochastics are almost always early and get overbought and stay overbought in a trend. So I built my own price oscillator, which uh, tends to lag a little bit, and I use that in conjunction when both are giving a signal that can be pretty interesting. Uh, and I follow those on pretty much a short intermediate term basis. The only thing I would say is on the breadth indicators, I follow the McClellan oscillator as a short-term tool, and the McClellan summation index as an intermediate term tool. Uh, I've tried working with weekly advanced decline data with things like the McClellan Oscillator, and I get absolutely nothing from it. So I just use the daily data like Sherman McClellan originally showed us how to do. Okay. Let's transition out of that topic uh, slowly. But uh, tell us, who who would you name as your greatest influences? And uh, do you have any favorite books you'd like to share with us? I will share some books with you. my favorite all-time stock market book is still Stock Market Logic by Norman Fosbeck. I think it's mm. a fabulous book. Um, I love Sherman McClellan's work and Sherman McClellan's book, Patterns for Profit. Larry Williams is a friend of mine. Most of my trading ideas and ways of looking at the market on a trading basis come from Larry Williams' works. <laughs> you know, his definitive guide or complete guide to the futures market is a two-volume set. Larry, sorry, I don't know if you're listening to this. I don't remember the exact name of the book, but that two-volume set is <laughs> very, very good. Um, but if I were going to buy any stock market books, it would probably be uh, Norman Fosbach's book and uh, either Charlie Kirkpatrick's book and Julie Dawquist's book or Murphy's mm. book um, for basic technical analysis. Yeah. You know, uh, regular listeners to these podcasts uh, w- will have guessed by now that I've set up sort of a template for our interviews. Um, this week, I'm going to try a new, uh, new question and see how that works. You're a guinea pig, Fred. Uh, and it's real simple. How do you relax? I drink. <laughs> I'm kidding. I do not drink. I, I, I do not drink at all. I'm teasing. Um, I live in a very nice area of Atlanta in a little neighborhood that's inside the city, and the distance around my neighborhood from my house to my house, if I walk completely around, is 2.4 miles. So I generally do a circuit of the neighborhood in the morning. I started doing a circuit of the neighborhood at night as well oh. because my girlfriend is on me to lose weight. Oh. I love the gym, and I am afraid I am completely addicted to trashy science fiction. If anyone wants to read one of the funniest science fiction books ever, it's a book called Prosso Plus by a fellow named Piers Anthony. It's about a dentist who comes into his office one day, finds an alien in the chair, refuses to treat him, so they kidnap him, and he flies around the galaxy treating various creatures' teeth. Absolutely hilarious. And that's how I relax, is basically reading stuff like that. If I have a personal eccentricity... I do not own a television. I have not owned a television since the late 60s, and I very rarely watch TV. Wow. Uh, that's that's almost as, as brazen as saying you drink. But You know, my mom 
saw me watch it, trying to poke the dog's eyes out with my fingers after watching the Three Stooges when that was a fairly Whoa. new show. Yeah. And she said, this TV business is violent. You can't have one anymore. And all I could say was she had no idea back then what she was doing, but it was the right thing to do. Yeah, and talk about being ahead of her time. All right, uh, Fred, gosh, we are we are at our deadline here, but we can't end this um, interview without getting your views on the market. And I'm not asking you to divulge anything that others have to pay for, but uh, let, me, let me read something you wrote and, and just tell us if you still believe it. And uh, if so, maybe you can flesh it out a little bit before we go. Uh, I'm, I'm reading something here. It says, as we write this, we are seeing some cracks in the intermediate technical picture of the markets. Sentiment indicators are moving into bearish positions, and some breadth indicators are weakening as well. This points to a significant peak later this year in a tough first and possibly second quarter for equities in 2011. We think that 2011 will ultimately be positive, though, with a strong second half of the year. That is correct. Let me amplify on that a little bit. Okay. Uh, I've been pretty much bullish all year, and I was fortunate enough to catch the July low actually before it happened and say it was the most significant low we were going to make for the year. Mm. Um, since that time, a couple of things in the marketplace have changed. We had very large leadership on the part of small and mid-cap stocks up until that time. The smaller and mid-cap stocks have taken over again but lagged for a period of time. Breadth indicators are starting to lag. We've had considerably more new lows than we've had previously on this phase of the move up. And what I am finally seeing is after the midterm elections, everyone is finally starting to acknowledge that the economy is really getting better and recovering and that the markets are going to do well. And, you know, we're going to blow through. I think we've really blown through all the 1,200 S&P resistance. That makes the market look, to, at least to me, like the uh, deflationary crash picture that we had in 1929. The analog of that is pretty much out the window. And at the same time, with the internals weakening, I think you'll have widespread acceptance that we're in a bull market just in time for a possible correction. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, everyone's like, here we go, thud, right? Right, right, right. But by the same token, I do think things are getting better, and I think that after a fairly meaningful correction, and some of these technical factors, by the way, can uh, obviously ameliorate themselves, and so we're we're watching that carefully. But this has got the best potential. This move up to be an intermediate term pause since we've seen in 2007, 2008, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Okay. Fred, it's been great having you with us today. Is there anything else you'd like to mention before we uh, conclude? No, just that uh, I'm really impressed with the MTA and the CMT program and uh, very, very happy to be a part of your podcast. Thank you. Oh, that's great. Well, we were, we were delighted you took the time to uh, join us today. Today's guest has been Fred Meisner, and that wraps up this week's MTA podcast. From SeattleTechnicalAdvisors.com, I'm Ed Carlson, together with our recording engineer, Shane Squark, in New York City. Say goodbye, Shane. We'll see you next time, everybody. All right. Let's keep our steps tight. Good day.